And we are absolutely delighted to have all of you here for what's a very important conversation and the first of our noontime conversations for the year. I want to leave all the time for what we're here for, namely that conversation, except for a really, really short um, heads up on some of the things that CTRL is doing that we want to make sure you know about, some of which relate directly to the topic of conversation today. On your tables are all kinds of pieces of paper, some from CTRL, some from elsewhere, that we hope will be helpful to you, either about programs or events or guidelines. One in particular I want to draw your attention to is called 10 Takeaways. It's a collection of teaching strategies that CTRL has put together with the help of a number of other people on campus. That um, This is the print version, but it's all online in much greater glory. And I invite you to take a look at it, because there are things that I think are going to be useful as you think about how you address not just teaching issues in general, but some of the very specific issues that we're here to talk about today. With that, I'm pleased to introduce the Associate Director in CTRL for Pedagogy, Marilyn Goldhammer, who will introduce the program. Marilyn. Thank you all. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, and then Rob Pratsky is going to introduce the topic to you. Good afternoon, I'm uh, Rob Horatsky, Assistant Vice President of Campus Life and Dean of Students. And in my role, I work a lot uh, with student support services. So uh, work closely with our academic support and disability support services, student counseling, student health, uh, also play a role with student conduct, so different kinds of issues that surface in that arena. Uh, and then work with our wellness programs as well as our orientation, transition, and retention programs in campus life. Hi, I'm Andrea Brenner. Uh, I've been a faculty member in the Department of Sociology since 1997. Um, I am also the uh, faculty director of the University College, uh, AU's largest living uh, learning community. Um, and I am the new director of the American University Experience, uh, AU's new mandatory course uh, that is rolling out for all first year students in a few years. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Deborah DeMille Wagman. I'm Director of Academic and Disability Support in the Academic Support and Access Center. It's always a mouthful and hard to get out. <laughs> but I've been at um, American University. I'm actually be starting, this is my 12th year, um, in, in the past three years as director. And I'm responsible for basically the, uh, overseeing the disability operations for students at the university. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Barrett. I am a captain at the Department of Public Safety. I oversee police operations for the Department of Public Safety. And to kind of put that in perspective, if folks have seen our officers walking around in the navy blue uniforms, those ladies and gentlemen fall under my umbrella. Um, we're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have not been here too terribly long. I've been here for about three years. I'm retired from George Mason University across the river. I worked there for 27 years, and that's also where I got my formal education. Um, right now, we have three uh, programs that we're really uh, focusing on. It includes crisis intervention, uh, an officer liaison program, and also a collaboration on assisting sexual assault victims. But we'll be talking more about those as we go along. It's good to be here. So on a regular basis uh, in the Dean of Students Office, we consult with faculty and staff across campus about different issues that arise both in the classroom, in the office environments, uh, and, and recognize that over the years, we're seeing a greater number of students who are coming to campus with different kinds of uh, concerns, perhaps uh, differing learning styles and so forth, that have started to contribute to ways that some of them may interact in the classroom environment. So today's panel is really an attempt at trying to really shed some light on what is disruptive behavior, how does it show up, uh, what are some suggestions, some practical ways that you can work with students who might be disruptive in the learning environment. Uh, and then after we sort of give you some thoughts and ideas 
based on our, our particular lens. Uh, then we have some case studies that we're going to share with you. We're going to break up the room into three different groups and talk through some uh, real life scenarios to talk through how we might handle situations that are occurring. You will hear some repetitiveness in some of the information that we're going to share, uh, and I think uh, that that's partly intentional. So as we go, you're going to hear us reiterating some things that we think are especially important for you to keep in mind as you're working with disruptive behavior. So first off, what is disruptive behavior? Um, and I think simply said, it's really any sort of behavior that occurs in the learning environment that interferes with the learning of other students. You can see that I put up some examples of different kinds of scenarios that might occur. Sometimes it's very uh, overt behavior uh, where someone physically is standing up, uh, might be physically disrupting the learning that's occurring in the classroom. Other times it's a little more subtle and it, it may be uh, ways that a student is uh, commenting on others' comments or ways that an individual is interrupting the flow of learning in the environment. Sometimes it occurs directly in the classroom. Sometimes it occurs in small group settings. And again, sometimes it could occur in the, uh, in the office setting as well. With regard to uh, expectations for managing behavior in the classroom, uh, this language comes from the Student Conduct Code, and it's important that uh, individuals understand whether you're a faculty member or whether you're a staff member conducting a workshop, that ultimately responsibility for managing behavior in the classroom is that of the instructor. Uh, so you have the authority to address the behavior that is occurring in those spaces, uh, and uh, you have the authority if behavior reaches a particular level to ask a student to leave the, the learning environment if their behavior is interfering with the learning of others. I do want to point out though, because sometimes uh, we will hear from individuals, gosh, I don't ever want this person back in my classroom uh, or in, my learning, in the learning environment. And I do want you to know that uh, before we can permanently remove a student from the learning environment, there is a conduct process that needs to occur so that the student has a full opportunity to uh, address the behaviors that are concerning and we figure out how best to uh, handle that particular situation. There's some questions that I would ask you to think about as you're assessing what's going on in the, the learning environment. And first, I think we need to recognize that every student has a particular baseline of behavior, right? So we know that some people are very expressive. Some people are very quiet and reserved. Uh, some people uh, will want to share their opinion about every issue uh, that's brought up in, in, in a particular class. Uh, there are many different ways that individuals present themselves in the learning environment. So once you sort of think about that baseline for a particular student, I think the next question is to really get a sense for how is the particular behavior that you're observing consistent with or uh, differing from the behavior that we know to expect from a particular student. The other thing we really want to look for is how the behavior is changing. Is it getting worse? Uh, is it putting others at risk? Uh, it's really important as we think about these behaviors that we keep in mind that early intervention is the best way to prevent a particular situation from becoming a crisis or from escalating to the point where uh, it's difficult to manage and handle. So uh, really intervening early on is going to be critical to help students understand your expectations, how they're out of line with uh, what's happening in the classroom, and then getting the student the support that they need in order to meet your expectations. There are also situations we know where uh, you just may not have a lot of experience dealing with a particular scenario that occurs and maybe you're just feeling really uncomfortable or you're feeling out of the realm of your expertise and you want to uh, consult with someone about what's going on. Those, we always want you to feel that uh, you have members on this panel, you have other resources around campus that we'll talk about in just a moment that are here to support you and here to help you talk through the best way to approach a particular situation that might occur. 
Here's some uh, sort of uh, high level kinds of suggestions of ways that you can begin to think about how you're going to manage behavior that's occurring in the classroom. First and foremost, if you're in a situation where you feel that you are at risk, your students are at risk, or an individual is at risk, we always want you to err on the side of caution uh, and get immediate help. So in cases of imminent danger, we always want you to call public safety uh, so that they can respond in the moment to any particular dangerous situations that may be occurring. Uh, oftentimes, though, you'll have an opportunity to respond to behavior that's occurring uh, in the classroom before it sort of reaches that point that it becomes alarming. Um, you, you'll hear some specific strategies from Andrea in just a moment, but you know, I think it's important that you set the expectation, you sort of establish those uh, ground rules up front with regard to what type uh, of really about civil discourse. So when you think about the conversations that you're having in class uh, between students, the way that you're framing these discussions, it's really important that you make known your expectations for how you expect people to respond to one another and maintaining that, that civil level of discourse. Um, if a, a student is agitated, if you're trying to redirect a conversation, if the student is not responsive to your attempts, it's okay again to ask them to leave the classroom. But it's going to be very important that you follow up with that student outside of class, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, better understand what's going on with that student, and then again lay out clearly what your expectations are. It, it's helpful after you've had that verbal conversation to follow it up in email make sure that everyone's on the same page with regard to the expectations uh, moving forward. Really important in these situations that students feel heard. So, you know, give them an opportunity to really talk about what was going on for them in the moment. Uh, what, what, what sort of drew out of them the emotions that they were having that contributed to the way that they handled those situations. Giving them an opportunity to feel heard and to really express all that was going on for them is going to help them to feel valued. It's going to also help them to feel heard and it will help them to, it'll help to de-escalate the situation moving forward. And then finally, it's really, really important when these situations occur that you uh, file a care network report. You put it on our radar, you let us know that this is going on. It may be that you feel that the situation is contained, um, there, there's no additional follow-up that's needed, but it's really helpful for us to have information about uh, what, what happens so that we in, in the Dean of Students office can begin to connect the dots. Uh, the, the great thing about the CARE Network is we get reports from academic advisors, we get reports from our faculty, we get reports from the residence halls, from the library, from the career center. So this really helps us to identify situations where students may be struggling in multiple environments so that, again, we can reach out and offer support, hopefully, before a situation becomes a crisis. What are our options for handling these situations? Um, I have seen a number of things uh, that we have done to help manage these situations. Uh, and the important thing to understand is that one size doesn't fit all. A lot of it is very context specific and we can work with you around the particular situation that's occurring to develop a behavioral agreement uh, with expectations moving forward. So for example, um, I can think of a situation where we had a student who was constantly uh, interrupting in class asking questions repeatedly and was asking to the tune of 12 to 15 questions in each class period uh, that was becoming disruptive in the learning environment. In that situation, the way that we resolved that was by helping the student understand that we wanted to make sure that their questions were addressed, but we actually put very clear limits in place. So when the, in the learning environment, we want to limit the number of questions that you ask in that particular case, we limited the questions to three, uh, but then said, please come to my office hours afterward, and I'll be happy to talk through any additional questions that you have to make sure that you're feeling comfortable with the material and have a chance to express your opinions about the material. So it's just one example of many uh, that we can be very clear about our expectations moving forward. 
sometimes, and Deborah will talk a little bit more about this, there might be something else going on with a student with regard to a disability where maybe they're not really understanding cues that you might expect them to be picking up on, right? So there may be some accommodations and things that we can put into place to help with those students. Sometimes we understand that the impact of a student's behavior affects not only the faculty member and the individual, but can really have an impact on the classroom. And that's where uh, we've had scenarios where I've actually come in and debriefed with the class about what happened and, and uh, looked at ways that we could move forward. We can also uh, coach the individual about how they can handle a debrief in the classroom and, and support the other students who are affected. So important to think about the total impact uh, on both the individual and the classroom. Um, in more extreme kinds of situations, we've reassigned students to another course section, or in cases where we felt there really was an immediate threat, we have uh, suspended the student until we could uh, get them the support that they needed to continue in the classroom. So lots of options uh, that are available for managing the, uh, the situation. Real quickly, I know Marilyn held up the Care Network brochure. You have those on your table. Uh, just keep in mind that that's a way for you to share concerns about students. Um, it's not a disciplinary action. You're not getting the student in trouble. Um, you know, we've heard concerns from some folks about this feels like Big Brother. Uh, and the reality is I could count on one hand in the eight years that I've been here, students who've actually reacted negatively to care reports. Uh, more often, students say, gosh, I, I'm glad someone noticed something was wrong and really appreciate uh, that someone reached out and tried to offer support to me. Uh, and you'll see this in the brochure as well. It's really easy to submit a care report. You go on to the MyAU portal, you click on Life at AU, and then just uh, click Care Network, express concern about a student, fill out a form. Uh, once we get that, that comes into the Dean of Students office. The uh, assistant dean reviews each and every report that comes through, assigns a case manager, and then that case manager is responsible for working with the student to resolve that situation. I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Andrea, and she's gonna talk about um, some very practical uh, tips. Thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is really specific to the classroom environment, although certainly it could be uh, uh, parlayed into any kind of workshop environment or class meeting uh, certainly does not need to be faculty centric um, so really what I'm saying here is your classroom your space their classrooms their opportunity to learn uh, and faculty members do need to establish a classroom environment where all students can learn it's as simple as that uh, they should have a professional responsibility to treat their students with understanding with dignity and with respect and if you look at the second bullet you'll see the same thing for students. Students should expect a classroom environment where they can learn um, and should have the responsibility to teach, to, to treat their professor and their peers with understanding, dignity, and respect. Um, but we also have a third bullet here, which is that if a student chooses to disclose information about their disabilities and their learning needs, the faculty member is responsible for making sure that the students receive their ASAC approved accommodations and as well that they demonstrate the flexibility in working with that student. I had a student recently who um, had an approved uh, use of a laptop in, in their course, um, went with their letter to their faculty member who said, yes, I understand you need to use a laptop for note taking, and then found in the next class that he needed to sit in a separate section of the room if he was using a laptop rather than uh, note taking by hand. So although the faculty member in this respect was allowing the use of the laptop, uh, they did not necessarily provide the student with the best learning environment for, for, that, for that student. So we need to sort of, I, I think, widen that definition. Know your limits uh, and use campus resources. Professors are educators. Uh, we're academics. We are not necessarily experts in handling behavioral issues in the classroom. And in many uh, respects, we should not be. Uh, but there are campus experts here who can help us. Uh, and so we should really be able to reach out to the Dean of Students Office, uh, CTRL, ASAC, the Counseling Center, and of course, Public Safety. They're our allies, and they're there to, to help us and to teach us. 
So I'd say here, uh, many times prevention is really the answer. Uh, the best time to deal with classroom disruption often occurs before it begins. Uh, and sometimes, I would say many times, disruptive behavior occurs because the communication between a faculty member or a staff member um, and the student uh, is not well established. Uh, so faculty can take steps to reduce the likelihood of these disruptive behaviors in the classroom by creating clear guidelines uh, and also a positive classroom environment. So I put together nine bullet points I just wanted to talk you through and show you some examples. Um, the first one is be even before class begins, designing a syllabus that sets the stage. Uh, it clearly um, outlines appropriate behavior. Faculty members often, we have no hesitation to talk about cell phone policies in our class, uh, but we really are a little bit um, hesitant often to talk about appropriate behavior in our class as well. Creating class ground rules with your students, and I actually just brought, I'm currently teaching a, a, a new AU experience course, and these are the class ground rules that my students came, do you mind holding this up? I'm a little short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so these are our class ground rules, and again, students came up with these uh, as a group, so it's in their own language. Uh, and these are all first year students. This is written on the second week of class. Be open minded to other people's ideas and opinions. Remember that everyone's opinions are based on their personal experiences. Civil conversations rather than personal attacks. Challenge ideas, not people. Speak with intent to educate or share. Don't assume everyone has the same knowledge on a topic. Don't be petty, again, student language. Uh, don't bring floor issues into the classroom. This is a, a class that is in a living learning environment, so in addition to uh, taking a class together, they're also living together. Uh, timely grading from a professor with useful comments that will help improve our writing. So again, they are allowed to come up with their own ground rules for class discussion, but also for what they think is appropriate for the faculty member as well. Thank you, Rob, appreciate that. Um, I do not bring my class ground rules to every class, but, uh, or I do not take them out. I have them with me in every class. I do not take them out. However, there are times when I feel that I need to sort of unroll that large post-it and, and I can say, it's there, it's in your words. Let's go back to our class ground rules. Um, number four, uh, excuse me, number three, expect respectful communication and, uh, re expect respectful communication and model it. Um, and I would say three and four are very similar to some of the parenting literature. Um, <laughs> students are looking for a model, uh, and this includes how we talk to a staff member from audiovisual who comes to fix something in our classroom, um, or a student who's late to class. Uh, students are often looking to us to see how to, how to model that behavior. Uh, and number four, responding to disruptive behavior consistently, treating all students uh, the same. Um, and in a timely manner. Uh, so again, it's not just what is said, uh, but that all students are held to the same standards. And I know that uh, Deborah's going to talk about that as well. Number five, as Rob mentioned, is labeling the disruptive behavior rather than quote unquote uh, uh, diagnosing the student. So in language, your behavior is this rather than I think you are or you are, right? That's not our place to diagnose. It's our place to comment on the behavior itself. Uh, number six, uh, expect uncomfortable discussions, and I would say welcome uncomfortable discussions in a classroom, uh, but in advance set up, a, set up a system to handle them. I use something in my uh, first year classes what I, that I call pause cards. Uh, you can just buy these on Amazon, uh, and they're, they're just brightly colored fluorescent cards that I have available. Every student gets one in every class discussion. Um, and when something gets out, of the ordinary, when a student is made to feel uncomfortable. That could be from language used. Uh, that could be um, because of a trigger, uh, a triggering event. Something where the student needs the discussion to pause. Um, they can hold this up. Usually the other students don't even notice it, but I will see it because it's so bright. Um, and this is wonderful for debates, and these are something that um, to have on hand is so inexpensive and such a wonderful way for students to know that they have control. Um, does it mean that the conversation won't continue? No, but it means that as a faculty member, I'll, I'll move it somewhere else. I'll know that something is, is out of sort, that's not sitting right. Um, number seven, recognize the diversity of stress and worry that students bring to campus. And this is a big one that we're getting a lot now, and uh, we have our first reflection assignments coming back from our first AU experience pilot. Uh, we asked them, what, what gives you stress? Kind of what puts knots in your stomach? And just two, two uh, comments that I'll, I'll, I'll show you. One, a student said, losing my wallet. And another student said, 
I need to get a job when I get to school or I will not be able to stay here. Okay, so the diversity of worry, both of those are very real concerns for those two students, but the diversity of worry, we have to reach the students where they're at and they're coming to us with a variety of experiences. Uh, number eight, understanding that every student has baseline behavior, as Rob mentioned before, and a personality. And again, we're looking for changes. So there might be a student who's introverted or extroverted student, maybe we don't even connect with personality-wise. That's not our business. Our business is to look for changes in that student and what their baseline is. And then the last one, as we mentioned before, knowing your ca campus partners and recognizing them as experts. Finally, I wanted to give you kind of four, uh, disrupt when disruptive behavior occurs, here, here are four ways uh, to talk about it without letting it slide. Step one, talk privately to the student about their behavior outside of the classroom. Um, discuss potential remedies. Reinforce what you discussed, as Rob said, in an email to the student. However, if the problem persists, taking it to the next level. Attempting to handle the disruptive behavior in the classroom, verbally requesting that the student stop the disruptive behavior, and in this situation would be in front of other students. Reinforcing what you discussed in an email to the student and copying the DNF student's office, as well as the department chair or the program director. Filing a care network report is also important. Step three, again, if the problem persists and we've elevated it, asking the student to leave the classroom, the faculty member should never leave the class. Consult with the dean of students or other appropriate campus partners to develop a plan for working with this particular student. And again, file a care network report. And then finally, as if the situation has really escalated, if you feel uncomfortable asking the student to leave, if the student refuses to leave, if there has been harm or injury to the student or fear of imminent harm or injury, um, we are asking you to call campus police. And every single faculty and staff member should have that number, 3636, already programmed in their cell phone. Uh, that's the campus uh, police emergency contact. Thank you. I have to preface my remarks first by saying, um, in some ways, I'm really loath to talk about behavior and disability because they're really, I don't want anyone to ever sort of stereotype, expect that the type of behavior that you're seeing is the result of the disability. Yes, it will sometimes impact behavior, but you know, I think that we all know that there's a really delightfully a, you know, broad range in this room, like a faculty of you know, staff, of students who all bring different unique experiences in their communication style body size, abilities, um, learning styles. And so, you know, never, you know, once again, emphasize one point here is like, respond to the behavior, react to the behavior. Don't react, don't make assumptions, don't diagnose. I'm currently, you know, after I leave this, I'm going back to my office to deal with a situation where a faculty member called out a student from class and said, you clearly have ADHD, you need to go to the ASAC. You know, what, you know, what that faculty member should have done was said, you know, your behavior is being disruptive. It's being distracting to other students. Um, here is like different academic support process, possibilities that are, that are available to you on campus. So um, really focus on the behavior, please don't diagnose. Um, that said, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about like who's registered in our office. As of last year, we had 971 students that documented a disability with us. What that basically means is that student has demonstrated they, that they have an impairment that substantially limits you know, one or more major life functions. Um, the top three things that students diagnose are ADHD, um, learning disabilities, and psychological disabilities. Note that all of those are invisible. I mean, in, you know, invisible disabilities tend to make people very uncomfortable because you know, people like what they can see. You know, it, they understand a person who is a wheelchair user who has an access issue. And it's hard to understand, you know, many of these things, will, people will make a lot of judgments about why someone's acting the way that they are. And it's often based on that person's inability to control him or herself or, you know, some other sort of judgment. If they could just do this a little bit better, this wouldn't be so hard for them. Um, approximately a third of the students that are registered with us have multiple disabilities. So these are, um, students that you know, are bringing a lot with them. All of these students have to be admissible to the university. They meet the same admissibility standards as any other student. 
um, you know, and what they do if they choose to, you know, they not and not every student with a disability registers with our office. You know, the law changes after you go from high school into college, and we have no responsibility because there's no free and appropriate public education available for college, we have no responsibility to seek out these students and say you need to be accommodated. They need to come to us. If they don't come to us, they're not accommodated, or should not be. Um, and I just think it's interesting, 11, we're slightly under, like, I think we're I, I'm not great at numbers, but about, um, you know, you can expect, you know, the, the most recent numbers I could find were from were about 11 percent of students on a college campus will have a disability. And you know our numbers. I think if I calculated out, math is not my strength. It came out somewhere above seven percent. So, um, you know, one cardinal rule here: all students, you know, in, in addition, they have to meet the same standards of com of um, conduct. Nobody gets an accommodation that allows them to be disruptive, um, and they also have to meet the same sort of learning outcomes for the class and you know, the expectations. There's no modification of curriculum. And when we determine like, what appropriate accommodations are, we often, you know, people are more familiar with like, extended time for testing, because in, everyone kind of gets that. But there may be we, we, a very lengthy process that our office goes through often is if a student's requesting accommodation, such as, say, um, a formula sheet for a, for a test. And we have to go we contact the professor, see if allowing that student to have a formula sheet ends up fundamentally altering what they're intending the student to learn. You know, if we're, rote memory is an important part of, like, of being able to um, do something, then, you know, I always see the classic example everybody gets is you don't get extended time when you're medical school to demonstrate CPR. You know, it, it's, it, it doesn't work. You know, you have to, you're not what we call otherwise qualified. <laughs> So we, we will sometimes, some students, most students are pretty much aware, the ones who end up coming to us, or particularly those who are not pushed to us by their parents, um, are pretty much aware of what has helped them to be successful in the past. And those students who have like, something that may in, you know, lend itself to a disruptive behavior, say Tourette's, they, they've known what, um, that they, they tend to tick loudly, and that student we might go ahead and approve an accommodation that they're able to take a break from class. That doesn't mean every student you get who has ability to take breaks on their, from class means that they have Tourette's. So don't make, jump to that conclusion. Um, the same student may need to take a break because they have Crohn's and they you know, need more frequent opportunity to go to the bathroom. Um, but we'll, we'll write in you know, ability you know, to, take, to take brief breaks. Um, no cold calling for students who may have like, you know, retrieval issues or um, you know, anxiety. Cold calling, unless you're in the law school, is never appropriate. <laughs> and I still have questions about it in the law school. But um, you know, the idea of like, you know, very few things, and you know, the really sort of um, t one of the things I really don't like are like clickers in classrooms where they respond. You, know, you have to answer something very quickly because most things that you're assessing don't need to be done very quickly to, in order to demonstrate that you know it. Um, Clear directions given, both orally and writing, might be you know for a student who has auditory processing, they may need to have it written down on you know paper as well as just trying to recall it. And then you know for students who have like, a, like Andrea was talking about behaviors where they tend to monopolize a conversation and they don't sort of know their limit. You know we, we often would work behind the scenes with that student and the professor and sort of come up with a contract agreement or si we have done silent signals like you know when, when I you know not like this but when you know <laughs> but it's something when I hold you know like when I do this or something that means like you've reached your limit or like you know you have get little cards and then when you've, you get three questions put them you know count them out as you ask them you know sort of ways of sort of helping them monitor themselves without you know bringing a lot of attention to them. And I, what I, I sort of think about is you know um, so some of the, the, what's really important is, like in, the, I think to me the best way of thinking about this is creating an inclusive environment because we can talk about accommodations and those sort of are based to like attempt to level the playing field for those students, but all students in a classroom really do, you know, benefit from like an inclusive learning style. And I was thinking about like, you know, not, not everyone is an extrovert. Not everybody is going to be able to quick thinkly, you know, think quickly on their feet. And I think about like the clarity and context and communication are so important. You know, offer a variety of options to demonstrate knowledge. You know, I always think you want a person to demonstrate through the way that they're um, most comfortable doing so. And I think one of the delightful things, one of the most common learning disabilities is usually it's a reading disability. And one of the biggest things I think has happened in the last 20 years is there's all kinds of way to get information into a student as opposed to just through reading. You know, whether it's like watching TED Talks or something. And, you know, there's a, think about the different ways of students can absorb information. Think about the fundamental structure of your class. You know, what it is that you're really teaching. 
we, we deal, you know, probably the thing that takes the biggest time for us is dealing with accommodations around attendance. Um, and often, you know, we have these discussions with professors and they'll say, well, they have to be, they can only have three absences. And, you know, the, the, the whole formula that we have to go through, then, you know, we look to guidance in the Office for Civil Rights, Department of Education, is you just can't say because I said so. It has to be because there's a reason for it. Is there, and there's actually all different steps, and some of you may have gotten those letters you go through, is it the class based heavily on participation? Is it an oral component to it? Is there, um, you know, what's, how is it going to impact if the student is not here? If it's a strict, what I call chalk and talk lecture, presence may not absolutely be necessary to be there. But so think about um, the Office of Civil Rights will give great deference to any decision that's made by an academic, provided they've thought it through and there's reasoning behind it. Like if you're going to ask for a language waiver, you know, is it part a fundamental part of the degree? If you, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, majoring in Italian, you have to learn Italian. You can't be an Italian major without, you know, knowing the language. Um, give clear, detailed instructions. Everybody benefits from that. Um, focus on the student's behavior. Don't speculate. Engage in reflexive listening. And, you know, I think that it really helps making sure you're understanding what the student is saying and you've heard them. It also, you know, in doing so, it also benefits everyone in the class who may not have heard. That student probably isn't the only one who hasn't heard what's, what was said. Um, think about small group participation. Getting up in front of a large group may be very difficult for a student. And it, when you do run into a problem, I can't, you know, emphasize also the importance of thinking about involving the student in the, solving the problem, involve them in the process, you know, and never ever embarrass. I think no, you know, everybody, ground will never embarrass anybody. And the next thing, which sort of seems like a little random segue, but I take every opportunity I can to talk about this, <laughs> because I think there's a lot of confusion about this. Um, and I had a lot of calls about animals in the past two weeks, so I, I kind of I told Rob I wanted to add this in, like because I'm, I'm out there preaching. But um, some things, and there's little cheat sheets on your on your tables. But the only animals that should be in your classroom should be a service animal, or an animal that's been that's been approved as an accommodation, and that student will have a letter. Service animals do not need to register with our office. They can only be a dog, or in some instances, a miniature horse. When you see a miniature horse, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're waiting you know, anxiously for the first one to appear on campus. Yeah, really important. I mean, you know, if you could, you could, this, if the person's, you know, you ask about the dog, and the person says this is a service dog. Legally, you only get to ask two questions, and you know, there is many, many flaws in this. But you get, get to ask two questions. You know, do you have a disability? And is a dog trained to do a specific task related to your disability? Do not go any further than that. That said, um, if every animal on this campus who, you know, has a legal right to be in the classroom, like a service dog or an animal, there's not very many that get approved as an accommodation by our office. But if, and if they do, they will have a letter, an accommodation letter saying that. Regardless if it's a service dog or an emotional support therapy assistance animal, it has to be under the control of the handler. It cannot be like I got a call last week from a professor where the dog was wandering around the classroom. And you know, that, you know, a service dog does not get to wander around the classroom and be disruptive, even, you know, even if the dog has the right to be there. Um, so, and when that does happen, you should also feel free to contact our, our office if you have any questions about that. So. And don't ask for a demonstration of the dog's skill they've been trained to do, please. <laughs> I mean, that, that really, they form the basis. The, the, the law really needs to, needs to be cleared up a little bit because it's really clear in some instances people are taking advantage of this and people who are savvy know how to answer the questions. But um, most people, you know, if you have a service, and a dog does not have to have a vest on either. There does not have to be any identifying information on the dog. So when do we call the police? Um, unfortunately, in our worlds today, there are situations where you, you might need some additional support, someone to come <coughs> immediately from outside the classroom to come and help you with a potential concern in the class. Um, we talk a little bit about what's, what's making you uncomfortable, what's making you unsafe. Um, the, the question that, that I always bring up for folks is, is, is the person uh, a threat to themselves, are they a threat of injury to themselves or to another person? Uh, and, that, and that would be uh, kind of the guiding question that I would give to you in your class setting. So is the person knocking over tables or chairs? Uh, are they assaulting someone? Are they threatening to assault someone? 
these things are all creating a potentially unsafe environment, not just for that individual, but for we have to also consider the other folks in the classroom. Um, so some specific instances, uh, I will say, number one is medical emergencies. Uh, we have uh, medical emergencies, I don't want to say on a daily basis, but quite often here, and we certainly know that they happen in the classroom. We're going to ask you to call us at 3636 to assist with a medical emergency. And the, the, the primary reason is when the fire and, or when the fire department responds to the campus, they usually do not know where they're going. Uh, the campus buildings do not have specific addresses. When we have a medical emergency, we'll send an officer to each gate, Fletcher or Glover, and they will meet the, the ambulance as they pull in, or the fire department. And we will escort them directly to where the emergency is. So that's very helpful. The other thing is we can also pro provide some very basic uh, uh, medical assistance and medical care, CPR, or whatever it might be, uh, to help the person until the medical folks get there, okay? Um, I mentioned crisis intervention teams. Um, a few years ago, some of our officers were very interested in uh, getting specifically trained in crisis intervention. Uh, I supported uh, one of our sergeants, and I said, yeah, this is great. Go for it. Let's do this. And we got him trained. We sent him to the Metropolitan Police Department's crisis intervention officers training. And then within a few months after he went through that training, he left, uh, which is usually how that works. <laughs> we did not want to stop the program. We have since trained about 20 of our officers. And in fact, uh, this past summer, we have our own training program that's actually nationally recognized <coughs> for officers here uh, in, in the consortium, but specifically geared toward officers working in the college, on a college campus. Um, what, what we do is the officers are trained specifically, many of the things that have already been mentioned, like de-escalation, active listening skills, um, establishing a rapport with a person, providing support, those are the types of things that our officers are specifically trained on with crisis intervention. The other thing we do is uh, we have a very uh, strong partnership with our counseling center here on campus with Campus Life. Uh, so we're, there's some talk about the care network. We had an incident the other day. Two students came in. They, were, they wanted to report some very disturbing behaviors of a, a fellow student. It wasn't necessarily police criminal matter, but very important that we send the information to the dean and get that person in the care network. So that's another place where we can help. Um, back to uh, crisis intervention teams. So the officers are specifically trained to help come and help de-escalate. Uh, we want to just show the support to our faculty, but also to the students. Um, and then also do what we have to do to ensure that the imminent concern or the imminent danger is uh, mitigated, okay? And then the follow-up to that is, is not that we only have a great relationship with our counseling center on Campus Life. Our crisis intervention officers get specific training with um, uh, folks here in the community, out in the District of Columbia. We work very closely. We actually have an MOU with the Department of Behavioral Health. So, for example, if someone came into your classroom that's not affiliated with the university, because we, we certainly have folks that might be homeless or suffering from or living with mental illness, and they come through the campus, we can also uh, help provide support and care for those folks as well uh, through our partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, so that's a little bit about our crisis intervention uh, team. We're, right now we have about 20 officers trained. Our goal is to get all of our patrol officers trained in crisis intervention. If you call us, uh, you can specifically ask for a crisis intervention officer, and we will send, uh, we'll send uh, one of our CIT officers. Uh, but I also want to say that even if they're not trained in crisis intervention, our officers are pretty good at establishing that rapport and trying to help de-escalate. Um, threat assessment team, I wanted to just mention, we, again, we also work very closely with Campus Life. We also have resources that are not affiliated with the campus um, to specifically look at situations where uh, there's a potential threat. So say that someone in your class is making you feel particularly uncomfortable based on what they're saying. So we talked about behavior and we're talking about changes in behavior. So maybe you've had a student that 
has consistently been very uh, well behaved, but then all of a sudden they're starting to act out. Uh, is there something manifesting with that student and with regard to their behavior that is causing concern and making people feel unsafe and uncomfortable? We can do some background uh, checks. We actually have a contract with a behavioral psychologist to help provide us with additional information as to whether or not this person might be uh, a serious concern with regard to future threat. Um, and again, we can't, we can't do this by ourselves. It's very important that we work together and communicate together to try and alleviate those particular concerns. Um, so what I would say is, so we have an immediate threat. Call us right away at 3636. We'll have an officer come. We'll have a CIT officer come. We'll help uh, mitigate that. If you're seeing troubling behaviors that are threatening in nature but that are not necessarily immediate, we can also help uh, provide uh, feedback and, and do an assessment with regard to that particular individual on what they might be uh, for potential future concern. We also will work very closely with Campus Life on those situations. Um, and then finally, the one that is never is well is always unsettling is active shooter. Again, in today's day and age, it's it's a very real uh, concern of folks. Uh, and one of the um, the biggest things that we've done is done training, well, training with staff, training with uh, faculty. And the, I guess the bottom line to it is, you know, what do you do in an active shooter situation? And it's exactly what it says there. It's run, hide, fight. There is a, um, a video uh, that you can Google. Just do run, hide, fight, and it'll, it's a Department of Homeland Security. And it's a pretty good uh, video. It explains exactly what run, hide, fight means. Um, but in an active shooter situation, you are responsible for no one but yourself and your own safety. Um, and if you have the ability to get away from harm's way, then we say run or leave the area and get off campus. Okay? If you're not able to do that, if the concern is, is you know, maybe right here on the floor or coming down the hallway or you see the individual when you walk out the door, then we would say hide. So what, what can we do to hide? What are some things that you can do to hide? Like right here, right now, what could we do? Hide There you go. So we'd squeeze about as many people as we can in that room. But you're absolutely right. Anything else in this room? We might hide behind the barrier. We might drop the blinds, right? Close the blinds on the windows. Turn the lights off. Ask everybody to turn your cell phones down. Cell phones are big. Um, lock the door. Uh, this past year, our department, our physical security branch of our department, um, put interior locks on all the classroom doors. So all of the classrooms should have a lock that, as a faculty member, you should just be able to turn it. And a person that tries to get in from the outside won't be able to get in. We have the key, so we can get in. Um, but a person that is trying to get in, won't be able to get in with that door locked. Uh, again, these tragedies, we try to learn from these tragedies, and they found that if the person cannot get into a room, they will move on. They're not going to waste time trying to get into a room. They are trying to find people, okay? So even just locking the door can be helpful. So that's hiding. Barricade the doors. Throw up all these tables against the door so the person can't get in. I, I heard in the Virginia Tech tragedy that two students literally put their feet against, feet against the door and it prevented the person from getting in the room. And it was as simple as that. Very, you know, unsettling, but it, it helped save their lives. And then the last thing that they talk about is fight. Uh, there, in some of these tragedies, we've learned of tragedies where persons put their head on a table or hide underneath the table and the, and the killer has come by and, um, you know, taken a life. Uh, the third part of this is if the person does get into the place or the room, you fight them, and you fight them aggressively. Uh, and the idea is to stop the threat, stop the harm. Um, so that's the uh, basic information that we provide for active shooter. Uh, just one other point, when first responders, and first responders are going to be coming really, really quickly. We, have, we work very closely with MPD on this. Um, the initial responders are not there to care for the injured. What are the initial first responders there to do, the first police officers? 
stop the threat, okay? We want to do everything we can to mitigate and stop any f further harm coming. So the first officers on the scene, they get together as a team. It could be one, maybe two officers, and they're going to go and engage and stop the threat. But you're going to get a whole lot of other folks coming behind them that are going to be there to help folks out, okay?